Okay, so let's go, I think. Um, welcome everybody to our webinar today that I'm really excited about and I'm really happy that so many of you joined. My name is Laura Eichbrecht. I will be um, presenting the webinar for you together with uh, Ulf. And I'm very happy to have Carmen and Ruben here as well. And Lilith will join us later as well. And as you all know, because you signed up, our subject today is called Next Normal, including students' views into shaping future higher education. And before we start, I want to give you a short overview of our plan for today. Um, first of all, of course, we want to introduce our subject to do that we are discussing today, but of course, also us, the panelists. And we also want to know who you are, where you are joining from. I think you're already starting to discuss it in the chat. Um, we have a little Mentimeter on it in a few minutes. And then Ulf Daniel Elas will do a little input on uh, research and theory of student participation for future higher education for us. Then Carmen Romero from the European Students' Union will um, talk to us about what student participation's role was in the last months. And then we will talk to Lilith uh, Dieringer and Ruben Janssens who've been part of our podcast projects in the last months and who are also very engaged when it comes to student participation. We want to talk to them about the last months and also about perspectives for the future. And then we are really looking forward to all your questions, ideas and um, perspectives on students' views and including them into shaping future higher education. So I think the term new normal and also The next step, next normal, is one that we are debating a lot today. But what does it actually mean and where are we right now? Apparently, there's a new normal, which means that in the last months, uh, higher education has changed so quickly. Uh, we all know that uh, this was due to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, we have experienced some changes that already have been there before that have been just accelerated. We're talking about Globalization, digitization is one of the central terms of this, uh, of those past months. So almost all higher education has switched to online from one day to the other. And uh, we have started with our research group. We, we found that this was really an exciting time. And this is also why we are talking today, because we've never had such a situation before, really. And this also means that it's kind of a a very strategic time to talk about future ed higher education and also to talk about this with uh, students who are the most affected and the most important group in this because higher education is with them and for them. And that's why we think it's very important to see how in this debate we can, uh, we can do it together with students and how can we talk about where to go right now, what our mission should be for the next months and years for the future of higher education. And this debate is what we want to start with you today. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to your ideas in this. Um, first of all, we would like to ask you who you are. And afterwards, we will present you who we are more closely. Um, you can see here the QR code. I will post a link in a second in the chat as well. So you can join um, the Mentimeter. And uh, then we will ask you the question, where are you right now? Which country? I think you've already posted it to the chat, but then we can, can see a little bit um, the distribution of countries where you are from, because this is really interesting for us. So I will shortly stop the screen sharing and post the link to you in the chat. Here we go. It works. Nice. Yes, people are joining already and I will share now the Mentimeter so you can see what's happening. Does it work? You see Hungary, Romania with me? Or you only send it to the panelists in the chat. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. Thanks for letting me know. So, 
now I think it should be working for everybody. So you can use this link or you can go to menti.com and use the code which is displayed in the, in the screen that I'm sharing right now. So the bigger the word, the more people type the word. So now we have uh, most people joining from Romania right now. I think we got a good mix. So it's, we have a lot of Europe. We have also India. India. Yes. Welcome. Really, really cool. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> and these are only 14 now. So we're missing 56. <laughs> oh, yeah. We are 82 participants right now. That's great. Uh, where, where do I have to type my, my country? Um, you can click the link as well. Yeah, I did it. But then I come to the side, and where do I have to type my country then? Mm. I don't see that. But OK. OK, so we have also now Sri Lanka, Turkey, and Ireland. Okay, so ah, yes, Laura, I think the link you shared is for the presentation. Uh, because if we follow the if we follow the link, we see the same presentation as you show on the screen right now. Uh, ah. But it's not it's not yeah. for entry. So it worked for the rest somehow. So let me just check for another link. I will stop sharing. Oh, it's so. it's easier if they go to mentimeter.com and use the code. Okay. Thank you. And here we go again with a shorter link. I think this one should work. Okay, so I will share again and then I think we will move to the next question. And you can um, stick with the link. It will be the same. Oh, we also have somebody from Mexico joining us, Serbia, England, Lithuania. UK. That's really great. So I'm really happy that we have such a uh, spread and colorful audience at all like that. Um, Germany, Ulf, I think you made it. <laughs> Taiwan, Portugal. Thanks everybody for joining. Okay. So we will have a, you can still tie because we can have a look at it later again as well. Um, so I will shortly go to the next question which is uh, that we want to learn about you, who we're actually talking to. Are we talking to a lot of students or people who are doing uh, research, etc.? Are you maybe working uh, in higher education as an administrative staff, etc.? So I think you can already start because the link is the same and I will share the screen to show you what I'm seeing right now because people are already joining um, the poll. So you, you may answer in um, multiple answers, because for me, myself, I would have to type teacher and researcher, for example. And I know that a student representative would usually be a student as well. So this is really exciting to see who we are actually talking to today. Seems to be a lot of teachers, but also researchers and students, what is really great. So we have 32 persons joining. We wait, wait until the 40, I think. Okay. So most of all, we have teachers 
And yes, we have some from the student science. Um, for the other, actually, if uh, it would be interesting for us to can, you may type in the chat what um, your profession is for those who chose other, because that's always very interesting. Okay, so thank you very much for joining uh, the survey. I will go back to our slides and I'm very happy that now we know a little bit more about who we are talking to. And now, of course, you should know who you are talking to. So sharing this screen, you should see my presentation. And so Ulf, I think we can introduce ourselves as um, today's presenters of it. Um, yeah, uh, maybe I can present you also just to give you a little rest. <laughs> so you are actually moderated today by Laura, Laura Eichbrecht. She's um, an academic researcher from the Baden-Württemberg Cooperative State University uh, in, in Germany, in the southwest of Germany. It's the biggest university in the southwest of Germany. Um, and um, I am Ulf Ehlers, uh, and um, we are together um, with some other people, our team forming the next education working group, and we're taking care of uh, research sub subjects in the field of digital transformation of um, educational institutions and of educational processes. And uh, we do a lot of work on future skills. I will introduce some, some of them later and uh, very happy to be with you today. Back to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, we're happy um, that Ulf and me from our research team that we're working on the yeah, future of higher education uh, to have this webinar today, because of course, this is a very exciting time for us. But um, as important as to present our panelists shortly to you. We will have more information from them later, but first of all, I want to um, welcome Carmen Romero today, who is the membership coordinator of the European Students' Union and herself a um, student in political science in Belgium right now, yet, but you're from Spain and really busy with um, yeah, student representation and uh, doing inclusive student representation also for an active citizenship. And um, it's great that you're here. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Then we have Lilith who will um, shortly join us. Um, always very tight schedule because Lilith is also a student. She was also part of our podcast series that we will present to you later. And uh, she is um, engaged in the student official student initiative, Digital Changemaker, that do with digitization of higher education and uh, its potential. So a very exciting time right now. And also in lots of other initiatives that she will maybe talk to you about later. So uh, for later, welcome Lilith. And then I'm also very happy to welcome Ruben Janssens, who I'm... I also know because he was part of our um, podcast project Next Normal for the one of the episodes on Belgium. And uh, he's a representative for um, at the European Students' Union for the FWS, the Vlaamse Vereniging van Studenten, and also a student in Ghent. And um, I'm really happy that you're joining us today. Welcome, Ruben. Thank you very much. One thing I forgot to say, actually, is that Laura is actually the face behind all the podcasts we are doing. Uh, so have a look at her when you think about our podcasts. That's uh, who's behind the, not the camera, but behind the microphone. I'm also very happy to have you all with us. Okay. So, of course, we, we are excited to hear more from all of you, from all our partners later. But we'll start with a part from you, Ulf, um, Perspectives from Research on student participation. Participation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. That's super that you introduce it like that. Actually, um, I'm just starting my time. I give myself 10 minutes, uh, which is not so easy for me. I love to talk about this. Student engagement is really a big, big topic and uh, can be seen from so many different angles. And student participation is a bit the same, but uh, maybe also a bit different. Um, 
I'm an educational researcher. I'm coming from this perspective, actually. Also, I'm a professor of educational management. That means I have a perspective on an organization. How do we organize in our institution education, higher education? That's a different question than an educational researcher, an educational scientist would have per se. Um, next slide, please. I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that when we think about students as an institution, as teachers, as those who create a curriculum, we really have to keep in mind that when these people are ready in our institutions, they're graduates, um, by the time they are graduates and by the time they start working and by the time they will then go through their lives, we actually do not know a lot about this time. Yeah? And this is what this thought experiment shows. A school beginner, my son is actually, uh, has started to go to school in 2016. He's 10 years old now. When he's, he's now actually 2020, he's just changing school and going to high, high school the first year now. When he's graduating from high school, it will be 2028 and, and so on and so on. And when he's receiving his master and starting to work, if he's going to a university, then it will be 2033. And if you think back 15 years, or if you first think ahead 15 years, it's 2033, uh, or let's say 13 years ahead. If you think back 13 years today, you come to 2007, that's the year when the first iPhone has been sold. And think about what has changed it. What do we know really about this kind of life we will have them, this kind of society, the challenges society, we know nothing about that. So what we have to think about when we think about students and student participation, we have to keep in mind that it should be really our aim to develop an autonomy, to support them to develop a learning autonomy, um, because they will be the, you all will be um, the decision makers in our society, and you will be faced with problems we cannot prepare you for. Next slide, please. And there are, sev there, there are several models to think about that, and that's the good thing. Um, in general, um, I brought you here a picture which shows three different uh, models. In general, when you think about teaching, you can divide teaching into three different philosophies. The left philosophy, called Know That or Facts, is a philosophy in which teachers are fed, uh, in which students are fed with knowledge by teachers who know what they, what the students have to know. In the middle one, the procedures one, uh, it's a different model. The different model is that in the middle one, the philosophy uh, is following um, uh, a concept in which teachers are giving problems to students, problems and the students are asked to solve these problems and thus become a bit more autonomous in their learning. Um, and this uh, problem solving is done in the, with the help in eye to eye, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, with the teachers and with others. <clears throat> and then we have the third one, which is a really exciting thing, but also very challenging for our university. It's going beyond this problem-based learning philosophy. This is the social practice philosophy, and that's a mode, a model of teaching in which teachers do not give problems to, to students, in which teachers are actually asking the students to first develop their own problems. Yeah? And we can talk a lot about that, but I don't have time for that to go really in depth. But this is a real exciting thing. Students in this according to this philosophy, they are asked to go out in society on farms, into organizations, in hospitals, in the next school and so on, and to understand how the system works there, and then to find out where is the break, where is the problem, where is something which doesn't work, and then describe that, identify that, and come back into university, go into groups, make projects out of that, and develop a solution for that. So that's what the future really needs. So, And you can understand already what it means on this kind of micro level I'm talking about, on the learning design level, to have students participating into this kind of um, learning and teaching, because then they are the ones who give the curriculum. They are the ones who develop the learning problems. Next slide, please. Um, another model which we have developed uh, already some years ago, which is now becoming more and more popular, is the model of open educational practice. Open educational practice now combines this idea of a 
student-centered learning design with using technology. So on the left side, you have, so to speak, the dimension of open learning design, which means basically um, a, a voyage from, um, from, from what I just discussed, from, um, from, the, from the point where you give students a predefined curriculum to the to the where, where you progress to to the point where you are allowing students freedom to choose their learning pathways and to choose um, uh, their learning objectives as well yeah and to combine that with implementing more and more technology and 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 so to speak um, empowering and developing a partnership and alliance with students to use technology to network themselves with other peers in their learning pathway. And uh, you can see how this voyage could go from the red to the green path. Next slide, please. I'm showing you this all because in educational um, philosophy, educational science, we have all these beautiful models like this one now, the last one, where you really see that the uh, metaphor of participation is really embedded into this model, which is called the community of practice model by Wenger. Um, which probably most of you, if you are in the teaching business, know. If, if you are students, you might not know that, but it's really worth, if you're interested in this field, to go in there and to have a look. So this is a model of learning in which you are actually do not use the metaphor of acquisition of knowledge anymore for learning, but in which you are really using the um, a metaphor of participation in which you are becoming part of a community and you're moving from the periphery to the center of a community through um, targeted, let's say, support actions, yeah, which you can call engagement, interaction, collaboration, uh, scaffolding. Maybe you have heard this. Um, next slide, please. So we can actively support uh, student participation on this micro level uh, in terms of educational design, which I think is really, really key to help students to develop an autonomous learning capacity and capability. We've done a lot of uh, work on what we call future skills, and we've just published half a year ago a book uh, and our results of a four-year uh, uh, research journey. Um, and we published 17 different future skills profiles. That's what we call them. I won't go into details here. You can download them uh, all open and free uh, of cost, open access and free of cost. But what we found is that this issue of self-organization and autonomy is one of three key issues for future skills of future graduates. Next slide, please. You can go here um, uh, to our website. You, we developed a skill finder, which where you can click on each skill and uh, find the definition and, and how, how, what is it entailing. Next slide, please. And as I said, I talked about different levels of participation. Um, as an educational scientist and as a teacher, I'm interested in this micro level on the classroom uh, uh, floor, so to speak, to work with students. Then we can also think about participation on a meso level. That means how do we involve students actually into our organization, into in our institution? What is the governance structure which we are giving students, which where we allow them to participate uh, in curriculum development, in organizational development, in uh, policy making within our institution. And then, of course, uh, on the macro level, also student engagement is important, um, in which um, uh, we, uh, so to speak, um, uh, ask students to come and participate in policy making of educational policies. Next slide, please. Just some small um, uh, examples. The future university will probably not look like today's university. The future university will be an institution which, of course, is more future skill oriented, where, where other skills, new skills, new skill profiles will be the object uh, of, of learning and teaching, uh, how I just uh, uh, described it. Self-organization, autonomy will be very, very important, self-management and so on. Um, leading uh, leading um, social movements will be important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but there's one thing which I would like to emphasize also in our work on future models for future universities. 
Um, we also saw that um, our experts, which we ask in Delphi studies, they were um, uh, expressing that probably the future university, the future studies, study pathway will not be a one institutional pathway where you study um, and start an institution one and then you finish an institution one, but probably which will be rather um, a, a journey through a longer time through several institutions where the learning from one institution is recognized mutually from the other institution. So, and that means basically we really need to see that students will become more and more and will be allowed actually more and more uh, autonomy, not just in the curriculum and the learning objectives in classroom, but also in the institutional setting which they are uh, choosing. And it will be important for our universities to start developing the scenarios so that we can understand what is actually entailed with that, because this is not the reality today. Next slide, please. We are practicing with several of these student participation metaphors in our own teaching projects. One very, very important, which you see here, is called the Grand Challenge, which we practiced the last three years, is a project in which we um, try to bring teaching and learning in university into the open. So what we did is actually we started with a teaching learning project with students, and then we organized a fully fledged um, countrywide uh, student um, uh, online conference, uh, which even was broadcasted on TV, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we, we found that for students, it is so important to uh, move the learning from this artificial um, uh, boundary limitation of the institution into the open, where they can participate with their visions for uh, society. Next slide, please. That's what um, Laura will also talk a little bit more about. That's a student participation on a different level. When the shutdown came in March, two weeks later already, we started, and Laura, that was Laura's initiative actually, and she's the real the energy uh, behind that. We started to interview and to, to, to discuss with students. Uh, and the real, real astonishing thing is that um, about about their um, their situation, how they are, how they study from home, how that works, what are their strategies, self-organization strategies, and so on. How do they survive, actually? What are their tips and tricks, and what do they expect from university? But um, the, what, what the real issue is, really, that this kind of project was gaining so much media attention because... Um, um, not just just us as teachers, but also society, societal stakeholders were, 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 were wondering, how is the situation actually for our learners? And how can we learn about that? How can we listen to them in order to be informed how we can uh, create solutions for this difficult shutdown uh, uh, online digital time? Next slide, please. You can download what um, uh, I said about the future skills here on nextskills.org. There are several videos and open access publications. Next slide, please. And I think that's already the last slide. And um, maybe, Laura, you want to tell us a little bit about our newest kid on the block. That's the newest EU project we just uh, won together with the European Students Union and others which will start soon, but what is it about? Yes, what is it about? It's called Inclusive <laughs> PhD for the Professional Higher Education. And I'm really excited about it, that we are part of it. Um, yeah, the acronym stands for Inclusive Engagement of Non-Traditional Students in Professional Higher Education. It's a three-year project with uh, seven project partners, amongst them also the European Students' Union, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and it's coordinated by Mondragon University in Spain. And the goal, the aim is to create a more inclusive environment and professional higher education institution. But this is done by more students participating actually in higher education. That means that they are represented on all levels of the, um, the experience of being a student at a higher education institution. What is lying below it is that um, professional higher education institutions attract a more diverse audience or more diverse student body with more non-traditional students. Um, for example, adult learners, lifelong learners, students with kids, students with a background of migration, students with disabilities, etc. So um, there's the goal of um, 
finding better um, practices for inclusive engagement of our students, regardless of the background and circumstances. And um, yeah, the goal is also to develop means to improve it. So we're really happy to be part of this project. Um, if there's a question for you, maybe you can, um, you want to shortly answer it It's um, before we move yeah. on. Um, it's from Thomas Richter, and um, I, I will just read it. Ulf, don't you still need to teach basics before the students can even identify and describe problems they may solve in future further steps? I think it's uh, yeah. three education models. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, thank you for the question. I think you're right. Um, I'm thinking about this uh, like a funnel or like a progression scale. Uh, when students uh, arrive, uh, they are usually from school, in, in for bachelor, for example, they're usually not uh, socialized in a free environment, an open environment, in a curious environment, but they are socialized in an, in an environment in school where it counts to uh, learn by heart uh, and uh, then uh, um, write that down and test. So um, that's true. We have to take them... Uh, Uh, and on this journey of, of progression, uh, of um, enlarging autonomy. Um, but I think that um, this, of course, can be um, done from the beginning, but uh, with a bit more guidance, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I will quickly move on with shortly presenting those podcast series that we are talking about all the time. Um, that we also have some very important people for this podcast project here, um, all of you, Huben, Lilith, and Carmen. So um, why we started the podcast, we already said it was important in this very spe special situation to, for us to ask actually how are students doing and how are they coping and how are they actually managing this totally different situation of studying for them. And yeah, how do they experience the recent situation and what are their needs and what can higher education institutions actually learn from it because um, uh, there were a lot of decisions taken, but not in all of them um, students views were included. So we have two podcast series. We actually started the first one in German, Studium im Shutdown, wir studieren zu Hause. We started it in the beginning of April. So really some weeks after our German university shutdown started, but I think it was about the same date for um, most countries actually. We've released 16 ex episodes so far and in this podcast we normally talk to individual students about their study experiences and how they are coping with the recent situation and uh, what could be done to improve it. We decided in summer that we you want to take as well a more European perspective because we are also working and moving so much in the European context and it's also for Our higher education, it's a context that is very important, um, no matter where you study and in what institution. And we are really happy that we could gain the European Students' Union as a partner for this. Um, Carmen is helping us a lot to find um, students from all over Europe, um, who are mostly also student representatives in a National Student Union. And um, yeah, we've done five episodes so far, but more are up to follow. And we're doing group interviews with, um, yeah, with students always from one European member state. And um, yeah, the focus is more on developing visions for the future of higher education. So it's a more visionary approach. Um, both podcast series are still out there. And of course, you can listen to them. And we are happy if you do so. And we are also very happy of, of uh, students who are interested in it. And we're also analyzing it as part of uh, some research that we're actually doing um, of, of um, also taking into account students' views on the recent situation. And uh, I won't talk to about it a lot. There's a lot of stuff that we could talk about, like how are things changing in what dimensions, uh, what are student self-study strategies? This is a very important subject right now. But also what about the, the cause digital social presence? Is there a solution of um, of finding ways to avoid isolation when studying at home, etc. So there's a lot of very important subjects that we uh, collect views in the podcast. And um, some central findings is that students are actually able to master Studium im Shutdown um, with self-organization and self-learning competences. But of course, this is not true for everyone. And that's also what we hear about in the podcast, that of course, there are major challenges to face 
Um, one of them is the, the cause of uh, social presence of not feeling alone when studying online. And that's also something where we're still looking for good solutions. Um, students are also not um, appreciating when there's only like lectures or only one form of education, but they're asking for rich learning scenarios. And also we hear a lot that there shouldn't be, an, uh, there's no way back to the old normal as it was before. But uh, for the next normal, we have to check what went well and what totally did not go well. And how can we include students' views in this? This is very important that most students say, okay, you have to, um, when you plan on the future, you should really look for the experiences and include students' views in this. And um, I think for this, we, it would be... Um, it will be very interesting to hear Carmen Romero, who, as I already said, helps us with the podcast, but who is also the membership um, coordinator at the European Students' Union. So she, you're in touch with so many student unions all over Europe, and I'm excited to hear a bit about what role they took, what student representation did in the last months, and what are the central potentials and challenges for the future. So the floor is yours. Thank you a lot. I'm, I'm really enjoying um, your presentations. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for inviting us to, to participate in this webinar and of course for involving us in such a wonderful project where students are being asked fundamental questions and they are able to raise their voices and share their concerns and opinions. Um, all of us are living turbulent times from, from students and youngsters to the elderly, as well as women, migrants, and unfortunately along, etc. Uh, this crisis is worsening the, the inequalities that already existed in our societies and many governments have been used, have, have used this health global crisis as an excuse to breach civil rights. In the um, concrete case of, of students, we have witnessed, as many times in the past, how academic authorities, but also policymakers, try to avoid including us in the decision-making process. ESU and, and its membership have been developing many initiatives to keep on helping students. Some of our member unions, for example, um, FEF in Belgium, sent a survey to the French-speaking students that had thousands of answers in just a couple of days, asking them basic things related to their necessities and challenges that came along with the studying from home. Our member union in Iceland, Lise, shared with us the result of another survey where students were asked about how they felt on a scale of 1 to 10. Over 73% of students fail, felt their well-being 5 or lower. In Cyprus, um, POFEN, the National Union of Students, has been informing about any news or updates through their social media. They asked the government to extend the application period of students' grant for a month. And additionally, additionally, right after the lockdown started, they managed to ask airlines to set a free of charge policy to enable students to change their flight without any extra cost till April. PSRP in Poland started a campaign, Students Home Alone, in which they did their best to convince students that traveling around the country and returning to their families could expose others to danger. Every day they publish activities which can be done at home, promoting a lot of ideas, blogs, uh, platforms and podcasts. Moreover, they open a help desk for international students in Poland and they had support in several, several languages such as English, German, Russian, Spanish, Italian, etc. Um, these are just uh, some examples of how engaged are students even in these hardest times. Um, and in my humble opinion, I think ESU as an organization can be, can be proud of its membership and of course uh, support them. The 6th of, of April, ESU published a statement, COVID-19, a um, multidimensional crisis that affects us all. And of course, we reflect on the consequences of the health crisis, uh, meaning that we are pretty much aware of the fact that there is a mobility crisis that, of course, affects students, but not only. And unfortunately, we are seeing and, and will see the beginning of an economic crisis and most probably a political one as well. At the end of this statement, ESU called for a global response to the pandemic with full access to reliable information, discoveries on the virus, its remedies and vaccines, as well as a common response to the developing economic crisis. 
I think it is important to, main, to mention that ESU, as well as many other members of the civil society, has been carrying um, out the same activities that we had already planned, but online. We had webinars, workshops, and conferences, projects, and probably even more workload, because the current situation adds extra complexity to the things we do. And we have to rethink not just the way, we stu the, the way students participate, but also the way ESU as an organization keep on moving forward. ESU, together with the University of Sadar and the Institute for the Development of Education in Croatia, led a survey on a student's life in the European higher education area during the COVID-19 pandemic, the first wave. Um, the Bologna follow-up group and its National Committee for Social Dimension in Higher Education supported this, this initiative. Um, this survey had over 17,000 responses. The majority of the, of the respondents aged 18 to 30 and this survey um, gave us an overall picture of the situation by then. For example, most of the students prefer face-to-face teacher-student interaction. 19.22% reported that their seminars had not been replaced with any online format. And 24.62% reported that practical classes were not being replaced by an online version. Regarding the workload, almost 50% of the responses stated that it was larger than before on-site classes were canceled. The situation for those who were working or were planning to work changed as well. 28.90% lost a job temporarily, 12.20% lost their job permanently, and 9% had had a salary cut. With, with regard to tuition fees and scholarships, 75% um, replied that the fee payment has remained the same, and just the 13% answer that their higher education institution had introduced flexible ways of paying fees during that term. In the case of scholarships, the 87% um, had the same amount of their scholarship, while a small but important 4% experienced how the amount of their scholarship was postponed. Um, let's remember that behind those numbers, there are thousands of students dealing with many challenges every day. What, what did ESU do with this information? Of course, we share it with our membership to seek to have greater emphasis on the role of higher education institutions in providing support to students, lobby for better student support service, and especially during these difficult times. The things mentioned before have been challenging students and students' organizations in many, many different ways. Um, I'm not going to say that all we did was perfect, but I can say that students' representatives and students in general did and are doing their best to cope with a situation that is not pleasant for anyone. If there is something we can learn from this crisis is that there are necessary things to be done and urgent things to be done. During this period, the whole world has focused on the pandemic and its outcomes, while many other issues are raised. For example, in Belarus, where tens of thousands of citizens have been demonstrating in the streets and showing their displeasure with Lukashenko's regime. ESU, together with BSA and BOS, nation, both national students' unions in Belarus, demand the Belaru Be Belarusian Ministry of Internal Affairs to free all detained students and stop the use of riot police, brutality and detainment of peaceful protesters demand justice for victims of police brutality and persecution and call upon the European higher education area to use all the international pressure on the Ministry of Education in Belarus in order to ensure that the rights of Belarusian students are protected. Additionally, many of our members' unions address their higher education ministry's representatives to condemn human rights abuses in Belarus and to recognize that Belarusian government as an illegitimate one. Not even a week ago, during our first online board meeting, delegates from all our member unions supported and stood in solidarity with the women in Poland facing attacks on their fundamental rights and the students protesting against repression and injustice there. Um, finally, as a society, we have many challenges ahead, the pre-existing ones and the ones that came along with the, with the pandemic. I would like to just mention, because it is something trendy now, one of them, which is the way we integrate digital tools in our routine. Lately, a lot of people talk about digitalization of education, and I do believe we can use technology to improve and make our lives easier. But we need to make sure that everyone can have an access to that tools and that higher education institutions are going to have enough resources to make it through the digital transition.
If we don't, and inequalities are accentuated, the new normal is going to look quite similar to the old normal. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the questions later. Thank you so much, Carmen, for the preparation, but first of all, for all the work that you have done to coordinate all this, uh, yeah, in the major challenge for this situation for students. And I think it was really, really um, good from your presentation to hear that um, what we also always need to stress is that studying, it's, it's great that we have digital tours to ensure digital teaching, but that's not all there is about studying and that we really need to consider all students' um, personal situation and include them somehow in the debate. And that's what you're actually doing. And I think the, the enormous amounts of um, surveys and participants and uh, measures taken, etc., show how important that is. And um, yeah, and I also like that you really stressed like the importance of um, students as civil actors as well. So Thank you very much for those very important insights. And I think that shows how much is done in student representation as well. So thank you very much. I'm also looking forward for everybody's questions later. So um, you can already think of them or post them in the um, Q&A. And um, I want to welcome Lilith Dieringer, who joined us uh, now. And um, yeah, as I already said, Lilith is also a student in Germany. She was part of our first um, podcast series, Studium im Shutdown, where we in interviewed her about uh, yeah, how education is working right now and how it should like in the future. And um, Lilith, you had a lot of great ideas, I think, about what uh, universities can learn from this. And you're also part of the Digital Changemaker Initiative. And uh, being an expert for many things, I know, because you're busy with many initiatives, but also for digitization, which is one of the uh, yeah, major topics right now as well. I want to ask you, like, from a point of view as a digital change maker, maybe you can also shortly present what that means. How did you perceive the last months and what role did digital tools and digitization play in this? And uh, maybe how is digitization linked to student participation as well? Welcome, Lilith. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. In general, maybe first of all, what is a digital change maker? I think like everyone can be a digital change maker, but the term in which like it is used in, in my context is kind of group initiative um, that is based on the HFD, Hochschulforum für Digitalisierung. And this is a really great network that is also connected with many, many universities and leaders at universities, also teachers, and helps all of them getting more into the yeah, digital world and this has been a topic for several years now but of course during the COVID um, yeah, pandemic and the restrictions now the need for going digital was quite high and um, we had a lot of universities that started to call us, write us emails and ask what to do and um, what best practices exist and we tried to help where possible. However, already before we um, started from a student perspective to change universities. The main focus on this program is that students are asked what they want and what is important before we decide to um, introduce new yeah, kind of lectures or everything, because um, this is an important perspective that at universities, the, the main people that are there are students. But in the last years, we have um, made the experience that the students were not often involved. And on the other hand, um, the teachers and lecturers, which um, we talked to, they were quite, um, yeah, not really nervous but they were a bit um, not knowing how to involve the students they like we had some people that were really highly engaged and that okay I really want to put effort in it I really want to change something but I just cannot reach my students so how can I do it I feel they are not really interested in my ideas and just say yes to everything that I do so how can I really get feedback from them and give them and yeah involve them in the process so um, we were yeah highly interested students in this topic who first of all um, helped those teachers and um, or suggested them some ideas and best practices, how to engage the students. And on the other side, we also try to spread the idea of getting involved um, into the student community because till now the students are kind of used, okay, there's just something that is offered to me and I yeah, basically have no chance then doing it. 
but we um, try to plan the the idea of getting involved and really give you ideas to stu um, to lecturers to the university. So what we did also during the last year um, is is a lot. <laughs> Maybe I pick out two two things. One is that we started to um, found those initiatives not only on a national level as we are at the moment organized from the HFD, but also on a local level. So we um, try at the moment to put um, digital change makers into universities all over the nation so that in kind of any universities there's a small group of students who are in contact with the university um, leading board and who are kind of responsible to get the vibe out of the students and communicate with the um, rest of the university. And um, that's why we now started some local groups that are still connected. We are um, yeah, digital formats at the moment. And also um, this enables us to share experiences and best practices all over Germany. The second um, format that we tried out this year is um, the so-called winter semester is coming format in which we every Monday um, during the COVID um, pandemic in um, spring, we interviewed some people uh, Mainly it was a mix of lecturers and students and ask what is happening at the moment at your university, what is good, what is bad, what needs to be improved regarding technical, methodological aspects, but also kind of on a policy um, level, if the students were involved, how they can be involved better. And at the moment we are um, kind of using all the knowledge that we gained from those interviews and put it into a video and also a paper that we um, soon want to publish, hopefully, and in which we kind of suggest what we can learn from the summer semester. So that's why the name is Winter Semester is Coming, because we want to learn what happens in the summer semester and what can we improve based on that for the winter semester. And we had really, really interesting talks. You still can watch those videos. Fortunately, they are in German. But um, for all of you who can understand a bit of German, you can still watch them. And as I said, we will also publish a video and a paper regarding the learnings. So only two small insights in what the whole digital change maker movement is doing. But um, I'm yeah open for questions and ideas from your side. Thank you very much, Lilith, for the really cool presentation. And yeah, also interesting insights into the Digital Changemaker Initiative. I think it, it was already really important what you did before, but uh, now it has gained, I think, a lot of visibility as well in the um, world of higher education. And um, I, I also um, will take as learning that the point of actually asking students what they want in education is very important. And that uh, we need to find ways to do this and to actually ask them and not only give them some choices that we already thought about before, but maybe really ask them beforehand um, to make it really open. And I think something else that you mentioned, which is really important, is that we are having a new semester, which is kind of a flashback to the old one because it's um, getting less and less hybrid and more and more um, completely digital. So I think your learnings will be very important. So, yeah, also for everybody, um, questions for Lilith, you can already type them in the section here in Zoom. And uh, yeah, we'll do some discussions later. Thank you very much, Lilith. And um, I now want to introduce Ruben. Um, I have a question to Lilith. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay. Um, the question is, um, from my experience, um, it is... Um, often not so easy to get into um, a good exchange uh, on, 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 a, on a good level between students and, and professors. Professors who hear about students wanting to choose their own curriculum, wanting to in, be involved into the, into the um, teaching, learning, design, um, um, they they are sometimes they are sometimes afraid. I'm not I'm not sure if it's really if they are afraid uh, if something goes wrong or so. But out of some reason they are afraid um, that they lose. I think their status there. And um, on the other hand, I think it's the only way 
to really get into a partnership between students and a real partnership between students and teachers if we break this break this uh, this uh, situation what what is your experience there Lilith? what what works and what doesn't work and how do you really get into an exchange and a dialogue with um, with with professors with teachers in higher education i mean that's a really important point and I would say that the the basic is that break kind of the barrier between the the one who teaches and the one who is taught because in the end we are both teaching each other kind of because I think that everyone can learn something from everyone and it's not basically the only one person who has knowledge and spread it into the heads of the students but also the students might have knowledge that um yeah the, the younger generation has and ideas how they they yeah gray, gray um or grew up, etc. So um, this is a really po important point that you maybe step back and understand that it's more like we learn together and we try to have a good and effective time. And it's interesting to discuss with the students and to, to get their way of, um, or to understand their way, how they understand it. So it always should be my approach to say, okay, I really, my, my goal is that they have fun learning and that they really are interested and motivated. So in the end, every student, every teacher kind of is individual um, and there are formats who fit for the ones and who don't fit for the others. So it's also, um, I would say, don't be um, dismotivated if you start to try something out and this just fails because, I mean, still from the fail, you can learn and it's not guaranteed that a best practice that works at one university or one class works in the other the same way. So just to be open and, as you said, ask the students. So um, possible things is that you start for a small lecture with an idea and then you immediately try to get feedback at the second lecture because then you are kind of agile and you are not saying, okay, I have now perfect idea for the whole semester and I will do it from zero to 10 until the last. And then in the end, I give them a feedback form and then it's kind of, okay, it was the last class and then they were the exam. It does not really help a lot. So that's what I would suggest to have maybe small ideas, try to implement them, get immediately feedback and try to still um, be flexible because everyone is individual in the end. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you very much um, for this interesting answer. Very important. Um, so again, <laughs> Ruben, welcome here. Um, I already introduced you a little bit before. You also, I didn't say what you're studying, actually. It's computer science engineering at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And you're being a student, but you're also um, much more amongst them uh, student representatives at the VWS, the Vlaamse Vereniging von Studenten. And in this also a representative at the European Students' Union. So for me, um, since you are busy on so many levels, um, be it national, local, and um, Europe-wide, Europe um, how did you perceive the last months from those different points of view? Yes, thank you, Laura. Thank you for the, the uh, great introduction. Uh, well, well, of course, student representation was very needed, but also very difficult in the last uh, bit more than half a year. We've been in this situation now. Uh, we have an expression in, in Belgium, well, no, in Dutch, uh, that says you have to row with the paddles that you have. Uh, so it basically means you have to, well, do make do with the, the tools that you have. Uh, one of the students, when I asked her um, uh, her input on how she um, experienced the past months, she said, well, we had to row without paddles. Uh, I think that's maybe uh, one one uh, perspective, but there there's... It's been it's been a bit difficult. Let me talk a bit about the different uh, the different levels that we have. Of course, um, uh, what's been talked about uh, right now a lot is the, is the micro level within one uh, course, uh, and and uh, we have a lot of student representation within uh, certain courses and within uh, certain um, uh, programs as well. Uh, we we talk also about student. Uh, participation at the level of a university, at the level of uh, the national level, uh, or for us, it's Flanders and the European level. But basically everywhere, we have two tasks as student representatives. We reach out to students to know what they, they want and to know uh, what their challenges are. Uh, and we reach out to the university management or the professors and so on. 
uh, and that's the same in in all the uh, in all these areas. And in both of those areas, uh, we've we've seen some some problems. Uh, on one side, uh, reaching the students, uh, it's difficult to continue. Uh, reaching students because obviously normally as student representatives we're students too uh, we meet students we we are able to talk to people we are in classes together most of the time um so that's that's a bit of a that's a difficult situation there's a lot less social contact and and some people are still in contact with each other but some other people also get more and more isolated uh, which is a problem that we've seen and that also has its ramifications in student representation um, and it's something that student representatives always struggle with, of course, not just looking at, at, at courses or a policy from your own perspective, but taking into account those of others as well. Um, and something else I, I heard about this uh, from uh, one of my fellow student representatives is that uh, we've seen that the, the pandemic has had a toll of, on the mental health of students. And it's also the case of student representatives. And of course, everyone's capacity has been a bit bit lowered uh, it's been difficult for everybody uh, and then combining this with keeping studying from a distance and uh, representing the students in a good way is sometimes a bit difficult um, so that those are a few of those uh, challenges um, and on on the other side as well explaining what's happening to the students has been difficult too and uh, I think there's a shared responsibility on many levels there. And we've, we've seen this a Belgian perspective, of course, that students and young people in general were a bit forgotten in the student representation uh, and in, sorry, in the communication about the, uh, about the crisis. Um, and, and that's a big problem. And we've seen that um, as well. It's, it's always difficult for student representatives to reach all of the students. We don't have, have the reach of, of all students in, uh, in one university, for example. Uh, and we've seen that the students uh, expect a lot, a lot of us and a lot of the universities as well. And it's been difficult to explain all of the, um, the measurement, well, all, all of the rules that were taken, uh, all of the changes that were, were happening, often because the rules were very confusing. Maybe that's just a, a bit of a Belgian thing as well. Um, uh, but we've seen that uh, individual students start with uh, uh, petitions, for example, to ask for the government for more social support, for example, for students who, um, who have lost their uh, student job. That's just one specific area. But we've seen a lot of these um, individual actions from student representatives. And it's been difficult because it's difficult, especially in the pandemic, to reach all of the students to kind of have a unified uh, voice here. Uh, however, I also have seen some, some positive things on this side. Uh, for example, my local student union uh, started a survey very specifically about do you have a place to study well? Because that's obviously one of the big problems that we've had. Uh, students who didn't uh, have a, a good place to study, who had problems at home. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of input was, was done here and uh, was given here to the student union. And they did a lot of work on contacting people all over Flanders. Um, to to make sure that that local city governments for example uh provided some study spaces and then they created a website uh, where students can find all these study spaces so we really see this grassroots action to provide to each other uh, these 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 places to study for example and to provide these services um so that's that's a bit the one side of of involving students but the other side is of course involving the the, the professors and university management uh, and so on and it's been difficult because it, it was dependent on how student representation was in this specific level or in this specific uh, program uh, uh, before. And in some places it was really good already. Uh, I think in the, the University of Ghent, we, we've got a pretty uh, solid student representation, but again, that difference from faculty to faculty, from program to program. Um, and in those where it went well, students were, I think, especially uh, after a bit of time, very well involved in others. Uh, it was kind of too difficult because then we also needed to have the initial cost of setting up good student representation. Uh, and then I think some people may have uh, got done the shortcut of, of just kind of forgetting about student representation. And especially in the beginning, this was very difficult, of course, because everybody needed to make very quick changes. Uh, and then students were often forgotten in this in this path. Um, also at university levels, and one of the things that we've seen not only in Flanders, but I've seen in uh, beyond Belgium as well, is that sometimes the media was informed of, of uh, new actions that were taken by university or by government uh, before the students. And that was something that's been frustrating everywhere. Um, it's, it's gotten a bit better over time, but it's always a, it's always a, a challenge. Um, but after, after a while, we've seen that uh, 
teachers, especially professors, have been involving the students more and more. Um, they've, they've, I think it, this has also been an opportunity uh, to rethink how student participation works and to revalue the, uh, the role of student representatives, even at the micro level. Um, and uh, I think professors have seen now because they've had to ask students, well, how do you want to do this digitally? Um, uh, and they now see, okay, well, we can continue involving the students. And I think that's a very good uh, ev evolution uh, in student representation. Um, uh, but however, as I said, that uh, the mental health impact has not only been on students, but also on professors. And of course, there's the situation where people are less open to input from students as well. But it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of everything. Um, let me say a few things about the national level too. Uh, one of the, the difficulties in the policy making is that not all institutions were um, uh, well, there was was a lot of differences in, in Belgium. The institutions have a lot of freedom in how they conduct their, their education. Um, and there was a lot of difficulty. So the Flemish role could not play as big of a role as for maybe the national level did in other countries. Uh, but as students, we, we do have a national students union, of course, uh, which is the Flemish union of students for people who don't speak Dutch. Um, and they, uh, because we had that one unified force there at the national level, uh, we were able to do some, some to realize some things. And for example, there was an emergency decree from the government uh, stipulating some changes in the educational policy to be able to cope with this uh, fast situation. And one of the things that was that student representatives had to be consulted uh, at basically every step, which is of course a very, uh, it's a fo very formal and, and uh, uh, policy-wise accomplishment, but it's very important. Uh, but again, at this national level, explaining uh, what's happening to students has been a, has been a difficult thing. Um, and lastly, uh, because uh, you, you asked about the European level as well, this is of course difficult because there's not too much responsibility for edge. Well, there's a lot of responsibilities for education at the European level, but a lot of things of course still happen at the national or at the institutional level. Uh, but I think one of the big difference is that at the European level, we are more accustomed to meeting each other online and to using these digital means. And I think that's that we've seen that in uh, being able to switch very quickly to webinar formats, because basically we already had experience with it from before. Um, and because I remember still in March, very quickly after the lockdowns were happening, the European Commission, Commission organized together with the European Students Union and the Erasmus Students Network, a webinar about the situation of exchange students uh, throughout Europe. And that was very, uh, uh, very informative and very helpful, I think, to everybody involved. Uh, and this format, this forum of a European Students Union has also been very useful for uh, students to um, exchange just the situations and get a bit of inspiration because everybody has their own style of doing student representation as well. Uh, we've talked about the, the civic engagement of student representatives too, and it's a situation that's very difficult, different, uh, different of course, uh, all throughout Europe. Uh, and I think we we were able to get some inspiration um, from each other as well. Uh, I can talk a, a lot more, um, uh, actually say a, a lot more things also about how exactly digital education can change, but I think maybe um, uh, we'll see what kind of questions there are and uh, I'll happily uh, ask more about uh, answer some of them. Thank you so much, Ruben, for all the input. And I think, uh, as you said, that it's really inspiring to listen to each other and to exchange. And I think we all got a lot of inspiration from um, what you just said. And um, yeah, as you also heard that there was a, a very interesting situation for student representation. There was more responsibility, maybe nor more visibility um, and uh, maybe sometimes a lot of responsibility um, <laughs> and um, yeah, patterns between teachers and learners and students and student representatives uh, changed, I guess, in this way. And what you also said, it's important to uh, not lose track of students that uh, who are hard to reach right now um, and also uh, saying th things about uh, that there are issues that are hard to deal with right now, like mental health issues, etc. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's very important to keep in mind also in a situation where decisions are taken quickly, it's also important to take a step back and to reflect for the future about those decisions. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, I think we heard so many things and I think there will be very many questions that we will probably not be able to all answer. So um, I think we can start right now with a question to Lilith. 
Um, so one, maybe, maybe it's quickly answered. What is the most demanded digital tool by the students? Asked by Fortunato Sorrentino. The most what digital tool? The most demanded digital tool. I, I think that it's not really a tool that can be said or generalized. It's more the way the teachers um, provide the, the tools and the lectures. I want to point out maybe two examples. At my university, the Technical University at Dresden, we could nominate um, from the summer semester the teachers and lectures that we really, really liked and um, which put a lot of effort in the kind of online teaching. And um, there were, for instance, two different that were really not the same and did not use the same tools, but were great in the same way. So um, one was um, a rational like a Russian course, language course. And um, the professor used an online learning platform. And on the online learning platform, she could put many, many links to different videos, for instance, to support our um, learning, but also um, implemented some um, small online tests and um, uploaded some further PDFs. And then we had kind of always one hour of teaching online, not one and a half, because also the, um, yeah, it's, it's quite of, um, important not to take too long lectures. And then the rest, the half um, plus the homework was on self-studying on this platform. And this was really great because um, we had this kind of repeating the stuff always on our own and could still use it. And it basically was an, an easy platform where she could give us the material. Like in the classroom, she could hand out material. Now on the plot, uh, platform, she could yeah, use all the tools that are in there. And she integrated a lot of tools, for instance, a wiki in which we could work together and um, tasks that we yeah try to use different methods. So one learning out of this is maybe don't use only one tool, but just try out because otherwise it gets maybe boring or only one-sided. And another example was that um, we had a professor who only uh, uploaded some videos. And during the videos, there were some questions that you had to answer before you could go on watching the videos. And this also was a great way to get the students involved and get them. It was a law course, get them really look into the law because you really had to um, put out your law book for answering questions. So um, it was kind of interactive and really nice as well. So I would say it really depends the content, but in general, try out different tools so that it does not get boring and always be open for the feedback of your students, what they say. If they say we just cannot use this tool anymore um, at all, it's kind of not uh, helpful for us, then try to find another one. Thank you, Lilith. Um, there's another question for you, but I think you can have a look at it. I think you can also see the um, Q&A as well. And um, I have a question from Liva van den Brande to the students, um, do you, which means uh, Carmen, Ruben and Lilith. Do you have the feeling that due to COVID-19, the digital learning is being enhanced and stimulated with innovative teaching strategies? Or do you see more emergency teaching situations going back to older teaching strategies? And what will be the impact of COVID-19 in this sense? I think there's a lot to say about this. <laughs> so um, I don't know who wants to start. Maybe uh, Ruben, you have something to say on this? Or Carmen? <laughs> well, uh, I think there's quite a few things to say about this. Uh, of course, of course, the situation is different for different courses and different professors. There's not one answer to give to this. And, and both things that are mentioned, both innovative digital tools and just completely revert, re reverting to old uh, teaching strategies, both of those happened. Uh, we saw the same as well when, when the lockdown kind of ended uh, around June, which is exam time for us. And also now uh, in September, when it was also still kind of lockdown free, everything. Um, that there were quite a few uh, professors who uh, made the choice, well, I want things to be as normal as possible. But that was definitely not the case everywhere. And we've seen uh, especially quite some uh, quite some teachers who have uh, embraced digital tools like, um, uh, well, one thing that was, was required at my university is uh, 
uh, lecture recordings. So every lecture that was still given had to be, it could be live streamed, but in case it was live streamed, it also had to be recorded. So students uh, had to be able to uh, to watch it later again, uh, because of course, uh, yeah, it's just impossible to keep track of all personal situations at this time. Um, but also some other things like uh, self tests on online uh, in a lot of uh, learning environments have this opportunity to have these kind of self tests. And that's something that was really appreciated by students. Um, so you you be able to get feedback without having any scores uh, attached to it uh, necessarily. Um, so so there's been there's been a lot of different uh, digital education uh, tools, um, but regarding more practical uh, learning experiences um, and internship as well, uh, well, there are replacement tasks for this, but we've seen that students don't really, well, they're not the same uh, and they can't, they can't replace the live alternative. So in these cases, um, uh, we hope that we can return to as much as normal as possible, but for more theoretical courses, uh, we've seen a lot of experimentation as well uh, with more online uh, courses like lecture recordings, short videos, uh, self tests and so on. And these things are appreciated by students. Um, so uh, I think that's definitely something that can continue in the, in the next normal. And maybe one thing to add to this is that um, students really have the well digital education and and learning from a screen basically seems to be more tiring uh, and more intensive than sitting in a live uh, uh, lecture and even though maybe technically the workload was exactly the same a lot of students reported that at least the perceived workload uh, was a lot more when everything had to be digital uh, so i don't have the, the the clear solution to this but that's definitely something uh, that has to be taken into account and i hope to have given a bit of an answer to this question now you have thank you very much um can somebody add, would, yeah, yeah can i add something yeah like i'm i'm, I'm gonna um based this intervention in my very own opinion as a student as well um so during the first lockdown um i had several classes and as as ruben said before like there is not just uh, an answer for this question there are many answers and there are many variables and i i do think it depends a lot on the professors like if they are able to to adapt the situation and we have also to acknowledge that professors are doing exactly like basically they are not just giving classes from home then they are giving classes from home in the middle of a pandemic which is not easy as well and and of course they don't have enough tools or enough resources to be able to adapt from one day to another so i'm um, with my intervention i don't mean to to blame professors on the way that they were developing or carrying out their activities their teaching activities but it depends a lot on them as it was also different um, in normal classes before uh, I, I think most of us can acknowledge that a professor can make a subject completely different than another professor and and the thing is like um I do think it is important to adapt, but it's also too important to to give them uh, resources and to give them like to, to develop their skills on how to know um, to give classes from home. Um, in one of the classes that I had during during the lockdown, the first lockdown, um, most of students were not uh, participating participating online. So out of maybe fifty students, we were in each of the classes five or six which for the ones that were in the classes, for me personally, it was amazing because the attention that we had from the professor, it was even better than in the class. We had debates, uh, basically anyone could ask a question anytime that they, we wanted because we were just five or six. But at the same time, for example, now I, I still have some classes and, and I have a subject that basically the professor is doing the same as if we were in the class. So basically it's like two hours talking about really deep <laughs> uh, concepts and, and broad questions that we are asked. And if it was already difficult to pay attention for two hours from the class, it's even more difficult to pay attention for two hours from my living room or from my room. So I do think um, in different kind of subjects, it's really needed um, to adapt the way that they are teaching. Um, and something that I wanted to share also that it's funny um, because I'm, I'm, I'm Spanish. So I've seen a lot of memes uh, from students in Spain comparing um, universities right now with platforms like Netflix or HBO, basically saying, yeah, well, for Netflix, one year, 20 euros. Um, Spanish universities, one year, 1,000 euros. So I think this is this also somehow showcased the way that students are perceiving um, the, the the way that they are learning and the way that teachers are teaching um, because it's like really not something bi-directional 
but also like one direction. So it's basically you are in front of the camera or you are in front of the, the computer and you're just listening, like watching a film or watching a series. And that shouldn't be the case. Um, so I, I loved Need to Be Done for sure. And I do agree with uh, all the things that Ruben was mentioning before as well. Um, but as I was saying at the beginning, um, we cannot blame just teachers or professors because they were also not ready for what was going to happen. Yeah, maybe just let me add to that as well. You know, as, as professors, we are products of, of, a, of an academic, um, of a dem academic career which um, asks us to, to be good scientists, but we have never been learning how to teach. That's just the naked truth. Um, of course, that's not true for all of us, but, but for most of, of, of us, that's, that's the case. Um, and when we do normal lectures in the normal, normal time, <laughs> We, 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 can, we can play with our personality, with our bodies, with our being there, our presence, yeah? But when we do, do online teaching, that's finished, <laughs> basically, um, uh, because we, we have black screens in front of us and, and, and that's it. So online teaching is really serving like a burning glass and it's showing if there is... Um, a learning design which is engaging mutually each other with each other entangling us into a carpet of interesting uh, exchanges and ideas and if that's not the case it's just a logistics exercise remaining that's it yeah just pushing over uh, information um, and this is difficult for us. This is really difficult for us. So for me, the next normal is is what what I say um, is an enhanced model, actually, where I hope that in a normal presential university we can keep one third or maybe a little bit more of online activities, uh, because I firmly believe that the value of it, the flexibility and the individual opportunities of learning in that um, is something we should cultivate, we should take on board, we should really embrace and develop for us um, into a new after beyond uh, corona, corona new, yeah, into a new, new consciousness of, of what academic teaching can be. Thank you. There were many answers to it, but maybe one last remark. I also would say that there is not like the, the border between old traditional teaching and new modern teaching. There are all facets of it. And just um, give you a, yeah, give you a go. Uh, record your lecture as it was before, because maybe you don't have time or don't have ideas and start to just stream this lecture and ask the students, okay, what can I do better? Where did you wish to ask a question or whatever? So, Maybe don't see it as a like big step to take. Oh my God, I n now need to go from my um, typical lecture to a totally fancy concept. Just try to do it step by step. Try to yeah test it out, and um, then you will succeed, I guess. So. Thank you, Lilith, and thank you everybody for answering this. I think this is a very highly debated topic that we could do another webinar on. So thank you very much. We're um, we're five minutes to go, and I would actually like to um, ask a final question to the panelists, maybe shortly answer. Uh, the future of higher education thought together with student participation. How can we become better in including students' views into shaping this future of higher education. Can I jump in quickly? <laughs> so I, I think something that it's really important is that we have to acknowledge that participation itself is a privilege. Um, all of us, even though we have uh, different uh, backgrounds, uh, social, cultural, economic backgrounds, um, we had the opportunity to participate. There are many students that because they have um, to help at home or because they have to work in order to maintain themselves at university, many other cases, um, they cannot participate and they cannot be heard. And those ones are the ones that we need to reach out because those ones are the ones that suffer the most the inequalities of the system. So something that I think it is important is to improve overall the, the situation of students um, in order to make them be able to participate. 
because as I was saying, participating, it's, it's a privilege. Um, so I, I do think that it's really important. And, and as, as, as I was saying before in my intervention, um, we, if, if we like maintain the same inequalities or worsen the situation right now because of the pandemic, um, the, the next normal, it's gonna look um, quite similar to the old normal, but it's gonna look as well um, worse to the old normal. And I think it is important to ensure that everyone have a, have, has access to education and that everyone has access to basic services, um, public services, um, in order to, to ensure that we're gonna um, end up this period um, stronger and not being weaker. Thank you so much. And you got a really nice answer in the chat. <laughs> if you can see it. Thank you for your answer. You are amazing. Great presentation. <laughs> Somebody else wants to answer to the question of um, future higher education student participation. Well, maybe shortly. Um, first, uh, one thing I, as uh, one way I saw another student uh, describe the education in the past. Uh, well, in the past semester was like a, a self-built um, set from IKEA. Uh, I think that was the case for both students and for professors as well. Um, and I think we can go further, of course, in the future. It will kind of be hybrid. We will take on digital things. We will take on tra traditional things. And the, the best way will probably be somewhere in between, like like Liz uh, said. Um, and I think the best way to... to incorporate students and student participation in this is to treat students as we equals. Uh, I think it was said earlier that there's kind of a, a difference uh, and uh, the, maybe a class difference uh, to, to say it this way. Uh, and that can, uh, if we try to move beyond this in, in program committees in my university, we, we are equal um, and, and it can be this way. And also this continuous feedback, like Lilith says, just try something and then ask the, the, uh, the feedback from students from it. That's absolutely the key, I think. Uh, not the way it may, may be more traditionally done, uh, implement a new teaching strategy and then at the end of the semester, uh, get, get get feedback and oh, this maybe didn't work as well or this actually worked very good uh, and it can be rolled up. Uh, onto other things. If you do not ask that after a few weeks, then you get just so much uh, more information and you can do so much more with it. Thank you, Ruben. And I think we, we're sadly coming to an end. We have um, more questions waiting in the in our question and answer box. And I actually saved them and we are happy if you get in touch with us after the webinar as well, as we're always um, happy to talk about those very important subjects. And I want to thank all of you for joining, for the audience, for asking exciting questions and also for giving positive feedback because it's something I think we all um, can appreciate and kind of need all of us <laughs> right now. So that's great. Uh, thank you all for joining and thank you very much for our panelists. To sum up, um, a little thing we always did in the end of our next normal podcast is asking students for their idea for the ideal future higher education in three words. So if you still have one minute, you're welcome to type something into the chat um, about yeah, what should the ideal, the utopia of future higher education look like for you. Um, and For the rest, um, thank you very much for joining. Thank you um, for contributing. And let's stay in touch. Here's our websites as well and also our contacts. And I think also Ruben, Carmen and Lilith are happy to, um, to get in touch with, uh, with the participants. So thank you very much for this, really, uh, this webinar that I really enjoyed. <laughs> and have a good evening, all of you. And thank you very much to Laura for moderation and for preparation and organization. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the fruitful discussion. It was really interesting. Yeah, maybe one, one last thing, share your knowledge. <laughs> Don't be shy, try it out, talk to others, and then we will do it all together.